what you are about to watch is an attempted systematic analysis of Islamism in Britain. Our journey encompasses the formation of Pakistan, Egyptian assassinations, London Tower Hamlet's elections, non-violent charities and extremist imams. The video will contend that Islamism runs very deep in British public life. Civil society organisations that claim to speak for moderate Muslims espouse and harbour Islamist aims and are able to wield considerable community influence. Anti-terror legislation's effectiveness is curtailed by deliberate non-cooperation of Islamist groups, who often themselves would be deemed extremist by said legislation. Many of these organisations do wish for the establishment of a caliphate and the implementation of Sharia law. This video will discuss who they are, where their ideologies originate, and the influences they have over segments of both Muslim and non-Muslim Britain. Our story doesn't start in Britain, but in Indo-Pakistan. Abu Mordudi, born in 1903, was one of many in a flurry of intellectual activity throughout the 20th century Muslim world. Islam and the Middle East were seemingly in decline, its land subjugated, its culture and beliefs challenged by the West. How are we best to explain the Malays facing the Muslim world and what can we do to reverse the situation were the questions many were starting to ask. Mordidi believed true liberation stemmed not from anti-colonial struggles in and of themselves, but instead from a rekindling of Islam. Islam itself was the revolutionary ideology required to liberate humanity. This necessitated the conception of a true and pure Islam that is singular and unmediated through culture, waiting to be discovered and applied in every aspect of life around the globe. For Mordadi, Islam was not solely a matter of belief, it encompassed every aspect of being. Islam is not a religion in the sense this term is commonly understood. It is a system encompassing all fields of living. Islam means politics, economics, legislation, science, humanism, health, psychology and sociology. It was through this rediscovery of self that Islam was to attain a revolutionary capacity. Islam is a revolutionary doctrine and system that overthrows governments. It seeks to overturn the whole universal social order. Even though Mordidi was viciously opposed to socialism, there certainly is an element of confluence here. Mordidi recognised Islam as a revolutionary ideology through which his constituents, Muslims, formed a global revolutionary class that had the obligation to topple the existing world order and institute Islamic governance on the world. It is the primary duty of all those who aspire to please God to launch an organised struggle, sparing neither life nor property for this purpose. The importance of securing power for the righteous is so fundamental that neglecting this struggle, one has no means left to please God. The organised struggle in Pakistan came to be jamaat e islami a political organisation founded by Mordidi in 1941 with the expressed goal of making Pakistan an Islamic state governed through Sharia. Mordidi is generally credited with the modern formulation of the caliphate that would gradually come to rule over the entire world. That said, Mordidi didn't believe in violence nor a top-down institution of Islamic practice. Instead, this was to happen gradually through the slow transformation of society as people embraced Islam. A prominent member of jamaat e islami came to be the civil engineer, Quran Murad, who translated many of Mordadi's works into English and sought to encourage similar movements being born in the West. He wrote, The movement in the West should reaffirm and re-emphasize the concept of total change and supremacy of Islam in the Western society as its ultimate objective, and allocate to it the highest priority. It shall not be realized unless the struggle is made by the locals, for it is only they who have the power to change the society into an Islamic society. 
As such, he actively encouraged and supported activist networks throughout the UK that attempted to realize the ambitions of Jamaat e Islami worldwide. In 1962, the UK Islamic Mission was founded, and through its vast network of mosques, it aimed to form the nucleus of an Islamic community, able to spearhead the total transformation of British society. This then became sedimented in a youth movement founded in 1984, named Young Muslims UK, whose spiritual father is credited as Quran Murad. Young Muslims UK became a huge success and eventually came to hold regular national camps that were able to accommodate for over a thousand Muslim youth. And by the mid 90s, it wasn't unusual for attendance to be over 3000. The group was able to mobilize large segments of British Muslims through holding regular events in English and grounding their work in a more politicized way increasing its relevance and making it a far cry from what was considered a wishy-washy, inward-looking and apolitical Islam practiced by their parents' generation. This is an important point. Young Muslims UK was popular not among newly arrived Islamic migrants, but amongst second-generation Muslims born in the UK and grappling with their Islamic identities in British society. A glossy magazine, Trends, was released and gained widespread circulation and the British-based organisation created international ties with other Islamist organisations, and even hosted speakers from groups and parties such as the Muslim Brotherhood, the Rafah Party in Turkey, and jamaat e islami among others. This helped sediment the impression that Islam was a global political movement with very specific political aspirations in mind. Another organisation of a very similar ideological strain is the Young Muslims Organisation, now, they're based around East London Mosque and are very specific to Tower Hamlets in London, mostly active throughout the 90s also. It is the youth wing of the Islamic Forum of Europe, which has strong influence over the mosque, with former leader Mohammed Abdul Bari since 2002 being the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the East London Mosque and also a former Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. The Islamic Forum of Europe were considered instrumental by George Galloway in becoming an MP for Tower Hamlets in 2005, after which he stated, I am indebted more than I can say, more than it would be wise for me to say, to the Islamic Forum of Europe. I believe they played the decisive role which found its echo amongst the leadership and the rank and file of the IFE, was undoubtedly decisive in this historic victory. The Islamic Forum of Europe has been accused of entryism in the local Labour Party branch also, and has wielded considerable influence over the Tower Hamlets Council, causing alarm in 2010. They were reportedly granted over £10 million of taxpayers' money, some of these funds given under the auspices of combating extremism. Problem is, how is extremism defined? Former senior activist of the Islamic Forum of Europe, Mohamed Rabani, is quoted as saying in 2009, Our goal is to create the true believer, and to then mobilize these believers into an organized force for change who will carry out dawah, preaching, hizbah, accountability, and jihad. This will lead to social change and an Islamic social and political order. I should clarify here, the group is not a violent one. The strategy is to encourage proper practice amongst Muslims to slowly but surely alter their host society through civil mobilization, politics and conduct. Jihad here does not refer to violent struggle, nor did it so much in the works of Mordari himself unless used defensively. Instead, Jihad is a tool through which to challenge the existing social order and gradually amend society through collective action. A true believer is the ideal Muslim, the Muslim that, through his behaviour, demonstrates the superior morality and beauty of Islam, and thus creates an Islamic state from the bottom up. Indeed, evidence of Mordadi's works being circulated by the East London Mosque and Islamic Forum of Europe was documented by a Channel 4 Dispatches documentary, entitled Britain's Islamic Republic, in 2010. This doesn't mean the organisation has no ties to violent Islamism. The Islamic Forum of Europe has welcomed Al-Qaeda-affiliated notables, 
including Anwar al-Awlaki, who spoke at an IFE-sponsored event at an East London mosque entitled Stop Police Terror, in which he stated, A Muslim is a brother of a Muslim. He does not oppress him, he does not betray him, and he does not hand him over. You don't hand over a Muslim to the enemies. This clearly has strong implications for government attempts to work with communities to prevent potential terrorist threats. This sentiment has been echoed by the higher echelons of the IFE. Mohamed Rabani, mentioned earlier, went on to become the managing director of CAGE, a Muslim prisoner outreach program that decries what they see as the unjust detention of Muslims. They are strong opponents of the government's counter-terrorism prevent strategy, claiming that it targets the political and religious sentiment of Islamism rather than what it calls politically motivated violence. Rabani is currently being charged under the Terrorism Act for refusing to cooperate with police by providing them with information under a routine stop and search. Now let's take a step back. We've already discussed Mordidi and the formative impact he had on Islamism as an ideology and how his softly softly approach encouraged some Muslim organisations to try to slowly transform their host societies and establish a caliphate. We've seen how this ideology has directly influenced certain Islamic organisations within the UK and as a result the politics of the UK also. However, let's not leave the trail here. We now turn to Egypt. In 1919 began a populist uprising against the British occupation of Egypt. This eventually led to the birth of Nasserism, a pan-Arab nationalism that sought to reinstate Arab identity and dignity and overthrew the monarchy in 1952. However, there were disagreements as to what a liberated Egypt should look like. The Muslim Brotherhood was founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna and was in many ways similar to jamaat e islami by 1948, over 2 million Egyptians were members, seeking to transform Egyptian society into an Islamic state. The military coup of 1952 brought renewed hope to the brothers, as many thought the military would be on their side and implement the Sharia. This never transpired and relations quickly soured between the free officers and the Muslim Brotherhood. By 1954, relations had deteriorated to the point that the organisation was officially prescribed and hundreds of Muslim brothers were imprisoned. Among those was Saeed Qutb. Prior to 1953, Qutb was an unaffiliated Islamist thinker who had formerly been involved in secular nationalist struggles but eventually came to the realisation that in order to truly escape from the Western yoke, it was necessary to abandon Western political concepts and embrace Islam as a revolutionary ideology. He felt let down by the Free Officers coup and NASA, whose commitment to a secular nation-state was viewed as a continuation of Western hegemony. It was in prison that could have expanded upon the Islamic concept of Jahiliya. Hitherto Jahiliya referred to the state of the world prior to Muhammad's message, that being a state of darkness, ignorance and barbarism. Qutb expanded this meaning to refer to the current state of the world governed by local apostate rulers. According to Qutb, it was the duty of all Muslims to wage jihad offensively against Jahiliya, to liberate the world and allow it to embrace the totalizing and global system of Islam. It is important to be clear here. For Qutb, jihad was not a means of waging war against civilians. Qutb would have been horrified to see it used against non-combatants. For Qutb, jihad was to be used to eliminate the impediments, preventing Islam's message from being spread. He wrote, It is the right of Islam to move first. Because Islam is not the belief of a single group, nor the system of a state, but the way of life, of God and a system for the world. Thus it has the right to move to destroy impediments, whether systems or circumstances, that rob the person of the freedom to choose. It does not attack individuals in order to compel them to embrace its creed, but it attacks systems and circumstances in order to liberate the individuals from the false influences that corrupt the innate nature of man and prevent freedom of choice. Such impediments for Qutb were the current rulers throughout Arab states, including Nasser himself. In effect, 
Qutb's work was a rallying cry, aiming to mobilize Muslims to topple the apostate rulers and implement the Sharia. Qutb was executed for his views in 1966 by the Nasser government. The Muslim Brotherhood and the works of Qutb have been influential throughout the world. It is important to distinguish some of Qutb's more urgent and radical ideas from the Brotherhood in general that are a largely non-violent organization. Also, just because a group is affiliated to the Brotherhood, it doesn't necessarily follow that they agree with Qutb's revolutionary zeal, even though their goals are the same. The European Council for Fatwa and Research, founded in London in 1997 by Yusuf al Qaradawi, a long-time key advisor for the Muslim Brotherhood, and Faisal Malawi, head of the Brotherhood in Lebanon, was created to help provide guidance for Muslims living throughout Europe. Until 2008, it was based at the headquarters of the Islamic Foundation of Europe, the jamaat e islami organization mentioned earlier in East London. The European Council for Fatwa and Research was itself founded by the Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe, whose leader Ahmed al-Rawi in 2005 stated, We are interlinked with the Muslim Brotherhood with a common point of view. We have a good close relationship. The Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe has over 28 member organizations throughout Europe all working to create a global Islamist network with the broad aims of establishing a sort of non-territorial Islamic state. The Muslim Association of Britain, formerly led by Anas al-Tikriti, between 2004 and 2005 has been regarded as a Muslim Brotherhood front organization, although the group denies this. Anas al-Tikriti is the son of Usama al-Tikriti, the former head of the Muslim Brotherhood in Iraq, and has since gone on to found the Cordoba Foundation, which David Cameron dubbed the Front for the Muslim Brotherhood in Britain. The group has strong ties to pro-Palestinian causes, including Hamas, which was initially founded as a Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood offshoot. The Muslim Association of Britain split in 2006 as disagreements arose between the increasing political wing of the group and the quieter, older elements within the organisation. Al-Tikriti founded the British Muslim Initiative as a result, alongside Palestinian activist and Hamas supporter Azam Tamimi and Mohammed Sawhala, a former senior Hamas activist who signed the 2009 Istanbul Declaration that urged Muslims to carry on with the jihad and resistance against the occupier until the liberation of all Palestine. The picture painted thus far is of a vast network of civil society organisations throughout the UK, broadly working towards the goal of forming an Islamic state through civil activism and also political alliances. Apart from Muslim Brotherhood links to Hamas, it is important to note that these organizations are non-violent and more or less non-confrontational. Instead, they draw on an idealized pan-Islamic identity or Ummah that transcends nation states that must work collectively to achieve their aims as Azam Tamimi stated to an audience in Manchester. I don't ever believe that there is something called European Muslims. We are Muslims in Europe and not European Muslims. We have an identity, we have our belief, we have our Sharia, and we have an Ummah that we are a part of. Again, this call to a unified, totalizing, collective Islamic identity mirrors the ideological roots of this project. Mordadi was the first to assign a revolutionary value to a global Muslim community and Qutb strengthened this divide by presenting the world as a struggle between Muslims and Jahiliya. This is the fruition of an Islamist Islam, supposedly unmediated through culture, despite the fact it was born at a very particular stage of world history in response to political and religious facets of its time. As we can see, the notion of the formation of an Islamic state isn't novel and has actually served as the animating force behind Islamist activism. However, in Britain, it's generally been conceived of as a relatively unspoken end game, with primary concern being placed on the welfare of Muslims and their position in society. There is an exception to this, however. They're banned in the Middle East, but support for them is growing in Britain. They're targeting young minds at universities and colleges. 
During the 90s, it wasn't uncommon to see stickers in public places throughout heavily populated Muslim areas within the UK. The stickers were an eye-catching red with the words Caliphate coming soon. They were left by the aggressive, erudite and confrontational organisation Hizbut Tahir. Founded in Palestine after the creation of Israel by Taqwidin al-Nabani, Hizbut Tahir, or the Party of Liberation, exists in over 40 countries. Its goal is the creation of a pan-Islamic state encompassing the entire world, and it found itself as one of the most active Islamist organisations in the UK throughout the 90s, fronted by the notorious Omar Bakri between 1986 and 1996. Bakri, born in Syria, reportedly joined the organization in Lebanon in 1979 and then went on to study at the prestigious al Assar University in Egypt before leaving after having disagreements with his teachers. He then travelled to Saudi Arabia to set up his Tahir cells but soon had to seek political asylum in Europe after being arrested in 1984. He found it in the UK. Although fronted by Bakri, someone thoroughly enmeshed in Islamism throughout his life, Hizbut Tahir was able to attract fresh converts to Islamism through its promotion of Islam in almost purely political terms. Its top three proponents under Bakri were Farid Qasim, Jamal Harwood and the now notorious Anjum Chowdhury. Farid Qasim was a former atheist, member of the Socialist Workers' Party and employed by Islington Borough Council. Jamal Harwood was a white British convert and J.P. Morgan accountant, and even Anjum Chowdhury during his time at university wasn't practicing and reportedly a bit of a party animal. This however played to their strengths. Mostly active on university campuses across the country, Farid Qasim set up stalls and exploited what he called Bobby and Abdullah syndrome, that being drawing attention to tensions between Islamic and British identities and present the only viable solution as the formation of a caliphate. For example, in one talk entitled Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll, members spoke about their experiences of licentious sex, drug use and clubbing, but then began to question the merits of such a lifestyle. They asked the audience how could Muslims engage in such behaviour in the West when Muslims in Bosnia were being killed by the droves. By the end of Bakri's leadership in 1996, they had a presence on over 50 university campuses across the country. In 1994, they held their first ever caliphate conference, held at the Wembley Arena. Up to 10,000 people were in attendance. Their timing was perfect, as conflicts around the world escalated. Strongly global in orientation, they were able to mobilize a global Islamic identity to politicize a generation. In 1991, the US military had stationed themselves in Saudi Arabia. By the mid-90s, atrocities in Bosnia attracted thousands of potential recruits, increasingly convinced that the security of a caliphate was the only way to protect Muslims from a global order becoming increasingly hostile. In response to increased interest, Hizbut Tahrir ramped up their rhetoric to gain maximum exposure. As their founder Nabani had stated, the Islamist does not flatter the people, is not courteous to the authorities or care for the people's customs and traditions, and does not give any attention to whether people will accept him or not. Rather, he must adhere to the ideology alone. His words were heeded. Although they were a non-violent organisation, they certainly engaged in violent rhetoric. Bakri infamously declared John Major a legitimate target for political assassination during the Gulf War. Their global leader, Abdul Zalam, wrote in his work how the caliphate was destroyed, For they, the British, are indeed the head of Kuffar, and they are the arch enemies of Islam. The Muslims should indeed harbour hatred for the British and a yearning for revenge over them. Britain served as the nerve centre, the global hub from which the Hizb could operate without state oppression. Hizb Tahir weren't endorsed by all Muslims, Indeed, only a minority would have followed such an overtly political interpretation of their religion. Indeed, Azam Tamimi, the Hamas activist and Muslim Brotherhood affiliate discussed earlier, urged other Muslim groups to avoid the Hizb, hoping it would fizzle out on its own accord. Problem was, Hizb Tahir faced next to zero state intervention, as it had done in the Arab world, 
and so was able to function freely and with basic impunity. Moreover, its scathing attack of British foreign policy resounded strongly with many British Muslims, even if many believed they lacked religious piety. Many Salafi Muslims, for example, were staunchly against the organisation, but the Hizb were able to retort on political grounds, claiming the Salafis were lackeys of the Saudi establishment, who had sold out on their faith to allow US military bases in the Holy Land. In all, Hizb Tahrir were able to instill its rhetoric and politicisation in a generation. They were responsible for putting the caliphate into the forefront of Muslim thought in the UK, whether in positive or negative terms, as again it needs to be stressed, the majority of Muslims were not a part of the movement. However, the ideological seeds planted cannot be understated, and they opened the minds of thousands to a violent jihadi rhetoric that would eventually be more receptive to the violent ideology of jihad waiting to be spilled on British soil. We now turn back to Egypt. On the 15th of October 1970, Anwar Sadat became the president of the country. He announced the birth of a corrective revolution, aiming to appease the more religiously minded Egyptians in a break from previous policy under Nasser. He freed Islamist prisoners and built a strategic alliance with them for political support. This ended up being his undoing. Sadat betrayed his base, he didn't institute the Sharia, he signed the Camp David peace accords with Israel, his wife was even filmed and televised dancing with US President Jimmy Carter. This was simply too far, and in the end, he was assassinated. Beneath the surface of Egyptian society bubbled a militant jihadist uprising. A document was circulated amongst a newly formed merger of violent revolutionaries named Egyptian Jihad. Authored by an electrical engineer, Mohammed Faraj, and entitled The Neglected Duty, this small pamphlet, circulated exclusively amongst the organisation, designated for a very tiny readership, was to radically influence jihad for generations. The neglected duty, as the name would suggest, opined jihad to be akin to a sixth pillar of Islam, and one that has been largely and strongly neglected, even denied, by present-day scholars. Prior to this, jihad had been widely regarded as a collective duty, to be utilised by all Muslims if their nations and their group were put under threat. Faraj essentially flipped this and claimed jihad is now an individual duty, as apostate rulers had come to dominate Muslim lands. He wrote, The rulers of these days are apostates. They have been brought up at the tables of colonialism, no matter whether of the crusading, the communist or the Zionist variety. They are Muslim only in name, even if they pray, fast and pretend that they are Muslims. It was thus incumbent on all Muslims to rise up and wage jihad, violent jihad, against local rulers. Faraj also made a twofold distinction between the near enemy and the far enemy. The far enemy consists of Israel, America, France and Britain. The near enemy, on the other hand, are the local apostate rulers who do the far enemy's bidding. Nowadays we are seeing a two-pronged approach by jihadis, an attack against the near enemy in the form of Islamic State in Syria, Iraq and Libya, and the far enemy as jihadis of all strains commit attacks from within Western nations. However, it's important to stress that this is a novel phenomenon. Prior to the mid-90s, the violent jihadi strain of Islam wasn't concerned with attacking Western nations or Israel directly, at least not at first. Faraj was executed for his involvement in Sadat's assassination. However, one terrorist cell leader was profoundly influenced by Faraj's works and strategy. That man was Ayman al-Zawahiri, now leader of al-Qaeda. Zawahiri at first had little interest in attacking the West directly. Indeed, even he famously stated, the road to Jerusalem leads through Cairo. The basic underpinning can be summarised by an internal document entitled The Inevitability of Confrontation by Egyptian Jihad in the late 80s that outlined four religious sanctioned priorities. 1. Toppling the impious ruler who has forsaken Islam. 2. Fighting any Muslim community that deserts Islam. 3. Re-establishing the caliphate and installing a caliph. 
4. Liberating the homeland, freeing the captives and spreading religion. Indeed, the emphasis here is very local. It wasn't until the collapse of the Soviet Union, the failure of jihadis within local conflicts and the arrival of American military stations on Saudi turf that things turned outwards and the West became a legitimate strategic target. And an alliance between Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri that would change the course of history. One confluence of ideas the jihadis were able to snatch from existing Islamist ideology was the notion of a pan-national ummah. This was of course harder to sell when struggles were confined to their respective countries. However, when jihad went global, it became a structural necessity. In his 1996 declaration of war against the Americans occupying the land of the two holy places, Bin Laden called on Muslims to hit the far enemy who divided the Ummah into small and little countries and pushed it, for the last few decades, into a state of confusion. The idea of a pan-Islamic identity had been mobilized previously throughout the war in Afghanistan and also subsequently as Muslims headed to Bosnia, as one jihadi related. We began to have real contact with other trends the enemies of the Ummah and the ideology of the Ummah began to evolve in our minds. We realized we were a nation that had a distinguished place among nations. Otherwise, what would make me leave Saudi Arabia, and I am of Yemeni origin, to go and fight in Bosnia? The issue of secular nationalism was put out of our minds, and we acquired a wider view than that, namely the issue of the Ummah. Although the issue was very simple at the start, yet it was a motive and an incentive for jihad. While the notion of a pan-Islamic ummah was already in existence, Islamist jihadis could claim to literally be living it as they heeded the call of jihad and helped their Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. So we have an obligation on Muslims to form an Islamic state, we have an obligation to wage jihad on an individual level rather than a collective one. For this jihad to be offensive as well as defensive to fight jahiliya and apostate rulers and lastly for this to be on a global level as Islam transcends national borders and forms a pan-national Islamic community or ummah. This was the birth of modern terrorism as we know it today. As for the UK, Omar Bakri left his Butahir in 1997 and founded the now banned Al Muhajirun, which has subsequently morphed into numerous other groups in response to government pressure. The group has expressed its aim as the establishment of an Islamic state in Britain and until recently was fronted by Anjum Chowdhury, now serving a prison sentence for support of Islamic state and foreign fighters. Frequently terror plots in the UK have been linked to the organisation including one of the attackers on London Bridge, the murder of Lee Rigby and one hindered attempt to use fertilizer bombs capable of killing hundreds. The group were able to garner a degree of legitimacy through associations with British mosques. One such example is the Finsbury Park Mosque whose Imam, Abu Hamza, between 1997 and 2003 was associated with Al Mujarun via the formation of the Islamic Council of Britain on the one year anniversary of 9-11. On the day of the group's formation, a meeting was held at the Finsbury Park Mosque celebrating the terrorist attack. Indeed, Wikileaks in 2011 released documents suggesting the mosque was a haven for extremists. Up to 35 fighters were sent there prior to being sent to Afghanistan to fight Allied forces. This corroborates with a prior report by The Observer that AK-47 weapons training had taken place inside the mosque, in the basement. Finsbury Park Mosque was closed by British authorities in 2003, but then reopened again in 2005 by the previously noted supposedly moderate Muslim Brotherhood-inspired organisation, Muslim Association of Britain. Of course, not all Muslims are Islamists. It's an issue of representation. Who gets to define Islam to the public? Who gets to speak for Islam? It is true that many civil society organizations, many prominent groups claiming to speak for Muslims, are Islamist. Registered charities have ties to Islamist organizations, and some groups have considerable support to the extent that they can sway elections, 
as was seen in Tower Hamlets in 2010. The media and government frequently ask for commentary and feedback on matters of extremism from Muslim organizations. But often these very organizations have links to the Islamist currents that form the bedrock of jihadi ideology. Their difference is strategy. Whether jamaat e islami Islamists see gradual transformation as the solution, the jihadi sees violent revolution as the only viable means. That these organizations have often abjectly refused cooperation with governmental anti-terrorism measures compounds the problem even further, as well as a permissive attitude to speakers that encourage separatist and violent Islamic trends. On the 13th of May 2017, just nine days prior to the Manchester Arena bombing, 3,000 gathered in Manchester for the funeral of Habib ur Rahman. The Manchester Council of Mosques had this to say about him. He was a religious leader who was instrumental in developing the vision and landscape of Muslims in the UK. He was a pioneer in establishing mosques and educational institutions and raised funds for the most vulnerable in our society and across the world. He promoted interfaith dialogue and encouraged citizens to work for the betterment of society. Habibur Rahman was a former president of the previously mentioned UK Islamic Mission, founded as a British wing of Islamist organization jamaat e islami based on the principles of Mordudi. Maybe he was a wonderful man, and I'm sure on a personal level he was. Nevertheless, he represented an ideology that has been unchallenged and with dire consequences. Isn't it alarming that these community leaders are so influential and that the majority of the public has no idea what they stand for? Next, I will cover the reasons why Islamist terror will continue to increase in Britain, as that's a story for another time. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked the video, please don't forget to click like and do subscribe. If you didn't click dislike, leave a comment, tell me where I went wrong. Massive thank you to all my patrons. Thank you so much for your support. It's thanks to you that these videos are regular. If it's within your means to do so, please consider donating yourself. Again, thanks for watching and until next time.